speaker is Ambassador Robert Blackwell, Henry Kissinger, Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy at the CF CFR. Please. <clears throat> Back in, be back in Israel. Um, I had one of uh, my two most rewarding professional experiences in a very long government career while assigned to uh, the U.S. Embassy in Israel at the time of Camp David. And I have many friends I can see uh, in the audience, and it's great to be back. I want to thank uh, Almos Godlin for the invitation to come, another old friend, he and I shared a productive educational experience at Harvard University. And uh, I can't think of a better director for uh, the Institute. So let me launch myself. Uh, I would first like to give you what I regard as the deep, indeed profound pros, uh, advantages, positive factors of the U.S.-Israel relationship right now and then uh, express my worries as we look ahead. I do that in the context of the paper that was just uh, described to us by Odin. And I just want to say I think it's a first-rate piece of work. And indeed, I would go on and say the papers for this conference are something of a miracle. Maybe they're not quite in the burning bush category, but committees produce something other than mush. And that's really quite remarkable. And if you read these uh, papers, and I, if you haven't, I really commend them to you, uh, they are muscular and provocative and prescriptive. And that's uh, very unusual. First, uh, the, the pros, uh, the positive things. There are uh, innumerable polls that demonstrate that Israel today is more popular among the American people and has more support in the American Congress than ever before. And with regard to the public, it isn't just in the Northeastern uh, Corridor or in Los Angeles where I live. It's in Lincoln, Nebraska and Wichita, Kansas and uh, Santa Fe and so forth. So deep, deep support for Israel. Second, uh, in an issue that was raised by uh, the paper, the good paper, uh, I think that more and more of the elite and even some of the public are seeing Israel as a strategic asset of the United States. There was division about this in, the, in uh, Oded's uh, team, but there isn't any division in my mind. I've written about it uh, myself, uh, Walt Slocum, former senior official in the Clinton Pentagon and I have written and it's on the Council on Foreign Relations website but I think that view uh, that in, di in addition to uh, history and moral responsibility that the third pillar of the relationship should be the strategic uh, benefits the United States accrues from Israel is gaining ground. Uh, going on as my friend Michelle Flournoy said last night uh, U.S.-Israel uh, defense and intelli intelligence cooperation has never been better in the history of the relationship. I want to say very explicitly as a rock-ribbed Republican, which I am, that I have no doubt that the Obama administration has an unbreakable commitment to the security of Israel. Doesn't mean I agree with uh, everything the administration does. Indeed, uh, to paraphrase Henry Kissinger, Barack Obama was my second choice in the last election. Uh, but uh, I have no doubt of the commitment of the administration to uh, the uh, security of Israel. Now, let me uh, next address uh, the various issues the committees uh, uh, of INSS looked at. First of all, Arab Spring, or whatever one wants to call it, uprising, revolt. Um, I think that there are not important differences between the United States and Israel with respect to the magnitude and, and difficulty of the challenges here. So that's positive. Unfortunately, neither the United States or Israel is going to have much effect on the outcomes. So we would agree on the problem, but we're not going to have much effect on the outcomes. And let me say in that regard, 
for what it's worth, if you balance opportunities and dangers, I'm afraid I see a lot more dangers than opportunities in the next three to five years. I will go further and say I think that for the United States, Israelis can decide for themselves, the United States, these events over the last year are bad for the United States, at least in the next three to five years. They may eventually turn out to be good, but uh, in the shorter term, they're bad for the United States in my opinion. Now I'd like to say something about the clouds on the horizon of the U.S.-Israel relationship as I pushed uh, the, the, uh, the calendar forward. Uh, and I'm going to speak government to government. So this obviously isn't Israeli people to American people. It's this Israeli government and this American government. And I see clouds, maybe even storm clouds on the horizon. First of all, and I think uh, Oded and I may disagree a little bit about this, it, I'm very worried about the personal relationship between the president and the prime minister. I've worked in the White House three different times on the National Security Council, and John has been there too. Uh, it matters. Good relations can soften disagreements. Bad relations can exacerbate disagreements. And what we, uh, at least uh, Americans, tend to forget that the fellow who goes to uh, work every morning in the Oval Office is called a homo sapien. And he has glands like all the rest of us. And he gets affected by his glands. And it matters that at least it's common knowledge that the Israeli Prime Minister, the American President, don't like each other very much. And that worries me. Second, Iran. As the report uh, says, and I, I agree entirely with it, there are well-known disagreements, despite the best efforts of the two governments uh, on Iran, on the timing of an Iranian breakout and the timing uh, objectives of a military operation. And those are very big issues. They're unresolved, as the report says, and I don't think they're going to get resolved just because of the different perspectives of the two uh, governments. Uh, and uh, I think both will go on working on it, but I don't think it's gonna, that's going to get resolved. But now there's a, a, one, a new issue that's not mentioned in the report, just because I think it's uh, been evolving over the last month, and that's the issue of the negotiated outcome. We heard uh, the Prime Minister last night and uh, the uh, Defense Minister this morning saying that uh, a negotiated outcome that was acceptable to Israel had to entail, one, no enrichment in Iran, the removal of all enriched uranium uh, from Iran, and the destruction of the enrichment facility near Qom. Um, I'm not now going to do the merits of the case uh, of whether that's reasonable, not reasonable. That's not my purpose. But what I can tell you is that the common view in Washington, the buzz, is that the administration, if it could get an agreement, will not insist on no enrichment in Iran and will not insist on the removal of all enriched uranium from Iran. Now, if that's the case, obviously we are in for a tough period between the two governments. And uh, let me just say two more things about this. In my own analytical judgment, the prime minister and uh, defense minister who hold these views strongly and have every right to do so, if their view was adopted by the P1 plus 6, the negotiating team that's been in Istanbul and Baghdad, there would be no agreement with Iran. There would be no agreement with Iran. And then the issue would be, how long do you let sanctions play out before you attack the Iranian uh, 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 nuclear facilities or not? So that's a non-negotiable position. But more important, that's my view, uh, it's not the way the Obama administration is headed with the P1 plus 5. And so I ask, uh, as I near the end of my comments, what will Israel do if the P1 plus 5 and Iran reach an, a negotiated agreement which does not meet the prime minister's requirements? Can you imagine a situation 
in which an agreement is announced, an agreement is announced, it's celebrated throughout the world, which it would be, thank God we've avoided war, and uh, by, I think, every country in the world, except Israel. Can you imagine Israel attacking Iran after that? Well, maybe it would, but if it did, and it of course would have to decide, it would be uh, an international pariah because what would be said was Israel waited until there was an agreement but wouldn't be satisfied unless it went to war with Iran. There's one last element of the Iranian issue which I want to mention, which is further out, but hasn't had enough, I think, attention. As I said before, and I stress, uh, given Israel's history, no American ought to give Israel lectures on defending its uh, national security. But I just want to mention to you the possibility that an Israeli attack on Iran would draw America into the war because of uh, Iranian counteractions and perhaps trigger a long war between the United States and the Persians. If that produced attacks in the American homeland, how many Americans would think Israel dragged us into this war and now our local shopping malls are being blown up? Think about it. Finally, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue, I think that Michelle last night and Rob Deneen this morning captured, I think, the prevalent view in this administration about the importance of reigniting the uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, negotiation. Uh, again, listening to the Prime Minister last night, I don't see that this government is going to be willing, again, others would ha perhaps have a more informed view, to do what Washington uh, wishes it to do with respect to the Palestinians. Uh, so I think both the issue of Iran and the issue of the Palestinians uh, and, and uh, an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation uh, could produce very rough waters in the uh, relationship ahead. Finally, uh, on the paper, it has, which is fashionable, of course, to think to, to remark on American decline. Uh, I think it was Warren Buffett who said, nobody ever made any money in betting against America. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not of that view uh, that uh, one needs to worry about it. I also don't think, and I think it, perhaps it was the translation, but there was a peculiar sentence that said, America's growing preoccupation with uh, Asia is a sign of a country in decline. Well, no it isn't. It's a sign of a growing change in the balance of power in the world and a natural American tropism. Uh, but I would say this, my last sentence is, as Israel uh, thinks about the future of its relationship with the United States, it has, I think, this daunting context, which at least I would assert. Uh, the United States today in the Middle East is the weakest it has been in power projection and influence since before the 1973 war. I don't think that's necessarily an abiding fact, but I believe it's the fact now it's something the United States needs to redress, but uh, it is, the, I think, the reality in the sandstorm that we heard about later, uh, earlier this morning. Thank you very much.